What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Marty Time Brews, where I'm your host, John Delray. Today, we're talking the important Packers. Now, it is the off-season. Packers are on vacation themselves. The mandatory minicamp is done. Now, we're just hanging out, waiting for the beginning of training camp. And while we do so, we can learn more about this team, find out some of their trends, and also just kind of pick apart some hypotheticals. Like, if someone is hurt, how bad does it go? What's the depth like at the positions? Today, we're going to be going through basically what is the five most important Packers that aren't named Jordan Love, and then maybe a bonus one in terms of reaching potential as well. Before we get to that, though, just a couple quick announcements. One, LTB Live is going to be late this week, giving different people a chance to hop on and ask their questions, etc. So it's going to be at 8 p.m. Central this coming Wednesday, just two days from now. Also, speaking of the calendar, the Green Bay Packers today released their 2024 training camp schedule. Look at that. Look at all the beautiful yellow days. Those are the open to the public days, a whopping 16 of them if you include family night this year. Also, a joint practice with the Baltimore Ravens, which is going to be oh so much fun. Now, as you know, I've been saying it for a while. My anticipation is right here for this channel. I'm planning on going to at least the vast majority of them. I know one I'm going to take off just so that I can take my son and enjoy the day, but I'm going to be there for weather permitting, basically every single one of these practices. And then I'm anticipating this year. Last year, if you recall, I took requests and then every single video thereafter, I put out a video basically like updating on the requests of players this year. I think I'm going to go live after every single one of these find a nice little spot in green bay and go live to talk to you fine folks about the green bay packers and what just happened at camp so that you can feel like you are there but if you need to hit pause and you need to check out that schedule oh by all means go right and do so because that is the training camp schedule also just want to throw this out there look at that look at that Jaden reed luke musgrave did not got bobble heads at the back of pro shop uh i haven't seen him in person yet but from the description on the pro shop if you hit the button it sings go pack go to you Check out the Packer Pro Shop for details. I do cover memorabilia ever so often, so um, <laughs> those are pretty freaking sweet. All right, so let's hit the topic. Who are really the five most important Packers and why? Why did I choose these ones over others? And I'm going to say right from the get-go that there's a number of different ways to determine important, right? Are they indispensable? Or is it a metric of if they get hurt, how do they get replaced? If they can't get replaced, that makes them pretty darn important. Or if they aren't on the field, does a quality of the team just drop off decidedly, right? Lots of different ways that you can go about defining important. I should also say too, that there's obviously more players than just these couple, because here's a, for instance, I didn't put Jair Alexander on this list. Why? Because even when he missed time last year, the Packers still did okay from a pass defense perspective. I use okay loosely. It was Joe Barry's defense, okay? But nonetheless, like we saw, Valentine can step in if need be. Now they have Stokes back. They have Valentine, who did great as a seventh round. So part of it's kind of depth behind him. Part of it is, you know, is he important to the team? Yes, of course. But if he misses two games, could they survive? Also, yes, of course. So this is more the way that I viewed it with the lens of if this individual misses, does a certain aspect of the Packers' success completely fall apart? And for a lot of these guys, yeah. Or the flip side, do they just really need them to perform so that they can reach their potential? Because there's a couple of those guys here on the list as well. So let's get to it. Number one, yeah, the new guy, Xavier McKinney. Not only was he paid like an important player, but here's the way that I like to think of it, okay? In Jeff Halfley's defense, now it's ultra aggressive, right? Going to be playing a lot of man defense. No, not probably over half the time, but still way more man than we're used to under Joe Barry. Ultra aggressive defense, man defense. When a cornerback happens to get beat, who's the last line of defense? Well, that's the safety. Or uh, how about uh, when a blitzer, linebacker, or an edge rusher happen to blow right past a running back who's actually running some kind of counter because their job is to go destroy the quarterback? Well, then who picks up the slack a lot of the time over on the far edge? Well, a lot of times it would be a safety. See, in both of those scenarios, when you think of the Packers defense, it's very easy to see both of those things happening occasionally, but also who's the guy that can solve that for them? It happens to be Xavier McKinney. Aggressive defenses in general, they always need a reliable safety. You need a reliable last line of defense. 
that won't contribute to issues but can stop them. Great aggressive defenses have not only a reliable safety, but one who can make plays for himself. And McKinney fits the bill in every single way. To comp it to last year, in some ways, Joe Barry's defense was actually kind of like safety friendly. They didn't need the world's best safeties to finish like 20th in defense. And it wasn't really a point of emphasis previously for Brian Gunnikutz either, right? The last couple of years have been... You know, they're just not addressing the position as much as maybe they could have. Xavier McKinney and a Joe Barry defense would make an impact. I don't want anything to do with a safety room of Darnell Savage and Jonathan Owens in a Jeff Halfley defense. It's very easy to see that going disastrously. And so Xavier McKinney does solve a lot of that stuff. If he happens to go down, do they still have Bullard? Yep, Jonathan Anthony Johnson Jr. Maybe he's taking a step forward. Right? They've got other draft choices, other developments. Sure. But Xavier McKinney is going to be the cog, the link, the whatever word you want to use to sync it all up. The answer to whatever can go wrong. And if Xavier McKinney does have to miss a stretch of time, if he's not going to be on the field, we will notice. There's no doubt about that in my mind. Number two, Rashawn. Oh, Rashawn. I detailed last week Gary's massive fall off in the pass rush department as the season continued to go on last year, including basically the final two months of the year, just like no sacks, exactly zero sacks from Sean Gary over the last two months of the season. His pressure numbers, his hurry numbers, everything continued to go down throughout the second half of the season. And at edge, you know, I've talked about how, like, I'm not including Jair because there's some depth there. Is there depth at edge? Yeah, absolutely. Because there's Preston opposite Rashawn, LBN. Hopefully he takes a step forward this year. Plus, I mean, you got the miraculously healthy Kingsley and Igbari back amongst others, including Brenton Cox Jr. Deslin Alexander's having a great offseason thus far. But Rashawn Gary is the best of them. He is the leader. He is the pass rusher that the offensive line is most likely to shift towards. And not only that, but considering over the years that Rashawn Gary, one of his big flaws, has been setting the edge against the run, it's reasonable to expect that no matter what opposing offenses are going to be shifting to him for run functions or to send extra blockers at him. Although I do have to say, last year he was overall better in run defense. But the big overall picture here, even with the two-month lapse in sack production, Rashawn Gary still led the team in sacks last year. Think of how far ahead you have to be in a statistical category, a cumulative one, to basically take two months off and still be the best on your team. And while the Packers did maintain some pass rush, it's pretty easy to see in season-long rankings. Like if you go back to the earlier parts of the year and look at Packers pass rush rankings league-wide, they're up there, right? And then at the midpoint, they're falling back a little bit, and then by the end, they're dropping all the way to 16th. It's fairly easy to see that as Rashawn Gary kind of got slower as the year went on, the productivity for the entire team began to lack as well. So, you know, basically, let's think of it this way. Whether you're in an ultra-aggressive defense or not, you want your stud pass rushers to be able to rush the passer without having to throw extra blitzers, without having to sacrifice from coverage in order to do it. Rashawn Gary is incredibly important from that facet. He is the one that can make all of that happen without scheming extra people to help. And if he misses time, there's just no one else on the team that's like him that can be as effective. Like McKinney, he's an incredibly important portion of the defense because there's just no one who can do it like him. Number three, rounding out the defense, we're talking Quay Walker. The, uh, you know, good said that he's going to be weak side linebacker. It seems like he's been playing some Mike as of late. It's been a really interesting career arc for Quay Walker thus far. As a rookie, he looked like a guy that just, he should not be reading defenses, especially on the run, but let him go hunt and he can be impactful for you. He'll also make some great tackles, but go have some misses too. And occasionally he's going to attack staff members from other teams, right? But the thing is last year, he became a really good tackler. His missed tackle rate dropped from over 10% down to 6%. He truly did not miss many tackles last year, but his coverage, his reading continued to be overall deficiencies because he just didn't become a strength there. I talked last week when I was talking about statistical trends, I talked about Quay Walker and I talked about the coverage numbers. How about how Walker didn't fare there? 
It just, it didn't happen. He did not do well again in coverage, but at the same token, I didn't talk about it, but it's true. In the run game, he also didn't do well. At least going by PFF's grades, Walker finished 41st out of 60 eligible linebackers in terms of run defense grade. And now Matt LaFleur is talking about how they're leaning towards having Quay Walker wear the green dot. Reading a run scheme and making a tackle is very, very different than reading alignments, making sure guys are lined up, etc. But there's also incredibly fair reason to be skeptical that Quay Walker has developed enough to ultimately be what is, I'm going to use this kind of loosely, but the signal caller of the defense, right? There's reason to be skeptical that Quay Walker can do it. Of course, we as fans, we hope the best, right? But it's kind of logical to say, well, the dude can't read the run. Now we're going to have him dictate the lanes. That's concerning. So he's going to have to take a large step up there without a doubt. He does have some experience doing it. In fact, the argument could pretty easily be made that some of his best games last year when Devondre Campbell was not alongside him. When he was able to be the one in charge, he played better. Like that, you could see it pretty clearly. But we just haven't seen enough development from Quay Walker to this point to say, yes, absolutely unequivocally, give him the green dot, allow him to line up everyone around him, and it'll go great. There's reason to be skeptical here. And if he misses a game, maybe they give the green dot to McKinney. Or, you know, they've got Edger and Cooper, but you're certainly not going to give it to a rookie, or maybe McDuffie comes in, right? So there are other options but the middle of the defense needs that leader you got kenny on the line you got rashad on the line you got mckinney and jair in the back where is the leader in the middle and that is what we have to hope that quay walker can become in part because of the responsibilities that it looks like he's going to have number four yep anders <laughs> oh buddy little anders Good teams need good kickers, right? Last year, Anders Carlson had 13 total misses between the regular season and the postseason. And I say this with the understanding that he might not even win the job. But Lesney's still there. Greg Joseph is still there. But I just, I, thus far, Anders Carlson looks like the best kicker of the three. I know Lafleur has said, well, they've all had their ups and downs. Well, per what's been reported, it kind of sounds like Anders is doing the best of them. And you've got to take everything into account with age, contract status, etc. He is still the leader to for the job, right? But of those 13 misses last year, two came at the end of a half. And two came in the fourth quarter. So four of the 13 came in pretty vital moments. It's hard to double up. You know, every coach goes, tries with the coin toss and all their advanced stats and all that kind of stuff. They try to double up at the end of the half, right? Put some points on right before the buzzer rings at the half. And then you get the ball back to start the second half and you can really double up, change the entire trajectory of the game. It's really freaking hard to double up when you march down the field and then your kicker misses. It's also hard to win in the playoffs when your kicker misses. Anders Carlson was not the sole reason for the loss in San Francisco. Of course not. I've been a big defender of his. This isn't a secret. But if he hits that field goal in the second round of the playoffs, in the fourth quarter, one of only two fourth quarter misses that he had, is the conversation around our Anders Carlson probably a little different? Yeah. It improves the Green Bay Packers' chances of winning that game pretty substantially. Is the conversation around them on the whole probably a little different, at least on the national level? Oh, yeah, probably, for sure. If they would have made it to the NFC Championship, yeah. So, great teams need great kickers. Going back over the last couple of years for Super Bowl winning teams, uh, Butker last year for the Kansas City Chiefs, he missed two field goals. No extra points this year. 11 missed kicks is a pretty big difference. Matt Gay for the Rams in 2021, he missed five total kicks over the span of the entire season. Going back to 2020 for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Suckup missed nine total kicks, including no field goals in the postseason and only one extra point. So only one of the nine came in their big postseason run in 2020. So if Anders Carlson can become like that, also becomes really important. But as Andrew Brandt says, good kickers are like lawyers. You never appreciate them. You never need one until you need a really good one, right? And if the Packers hope to achieve as much as everyone seems to believe that they can achieve, Anders Carlson will have to become the kind of consistent kicker 
that can do it. He has to become the kind of consistent kicker that you can bank on, that you can give a 40-yard chip shot in the second quarter. And he's going to hit it because eight of his 13 misses happened in the second quarter inexplicably. I, I've i been thinking all day about why why the second quarter? I can't, I got nothing. I don't know why a kicker would be worse in the second than third or the first, but Anders was. And the Packers, as they go to double up, as they are in tight games against good teams, they're going to need someone they can rely on. Anders Carlson, for better or worse, is incredibly important for the Packers to reach their potential. Let's go to the offensive side of the ball. Yeah, I got it, Zach Tom. Injuries happen on the offensive line, right? But one place that the Packers really can't afford it to happen to is their best offensive lineman in Zach Tom. Yeah, last year, Elton Jenkins didn't quite play to the level that we had seen Alan Jenkins do previously. Zach Tom really seemed to ascend right past him. And I should note too, right tackle in a lot of ways is a more important position than left guard, which is really where Jenkins seems to play his best. Whereas Zach Tom, just to, to comp the two, and this is no knock on Jenkins. He's still one of the best cards in the league. But Zach Tom seems to be able to go anywhere from left tackle, right tackle, left guard, right guard. Doesn't matter. Put him anywhere. Hall of Fame center. There doesn't seem to be this massive drop-off. Whereas when you put Elton Jenkins a tackle, he's fine. But there's definitely some kind of drop in his level of play. So if Rasheed Walker goes down at left tackle, could Elton Jenkins kick out? Yep. But Zach Tom would probably be better there at left tackle. And what's incredibly cool about Zach Tom is heading into the year last year, there was kind of this narrative out there that he was going to be a little bit of a question mark. Like he had this incredibly promising rookie season. Then all of a sudden, like we're sliding him in at right tackle. And there was even talk of whether he would be better on the left side than he is on the right side. And then all he did once they actually started playing was become a top five, top eight right tackle in the NFL. Or not just PFF, but most metrics in top five, eight at right tackle alone. And then in terms of run blocking grades for tackles, left or right, who played at least 80% of their team snaps, Zach Tom finished fifth in run blocking grade. So the guy who was deemed as not really a mauler in the run game seems to do just fine in the run game. And this is purely anecdotal. I don't really have numbers to back this up, but think again to that San Francisco game that ended the season. Life got a lot harder for Jordan Love when Zach Tom left the game injured. Of course, that's the case for any offensive lineman, right? But I got to believe that if Zach Tom missed the fall off, the difficulty of life for Jordan Love becomes harder than if anyone else walks off the field. We need to hope now that his pec heals and that he's good to go. But it really seems the most true for Zach Tom that he is the one that just would be missed too much. And the last player, this is kind of a bonus player in this concept because we know if this player misses a bunch of time, we know that if this player just isn't there, can they still be successful as an offense? Yep, we have the proof, actually. <laughs> like, there's no doubt about it. But this isn't necessarily to just win games in general. This is for the offense to overall reach the highest levels of its potential. And that does indeed have to be Christian Watson. Again, are there other important ones? Yeah. If Josh Jacobs misses time, is that bad for the run game? Uh-huh. Of course it is. But at the same time, you know, there's still other running backs that can at least help to function, right? Christian Watson does things that no other wide receiver on this team can do. And again, there's no real numbers to bear this out. But if you go watch the games last year that Chris Watson played, even when he wasn't 100% healthy, it was so obvious the gravitational pull that he has amongst opposing secondaries. You could see the panic from a number of safety's eyes when they saw the tall, fast one go running past them. I mean, people just seem to pull. See, people seem to float towards Christian Watson. And then in turn, that does open up stuff for Dobbs, for Reed. For Wicks. It's part of the reason that I believe the argument does exist that of all of the wide receivers, no, they don't have a true number one, or they've got four number ones, whatever semantics you want to get into. Christian Watson is the one that truly can do some things that no one else can. He may be the pseudo one-ish of the bunch, if that's your flavor. But, and this is a fairly large but here, 
That doesn't mean Jordan Love should really force him the ball either. See, because last year, Jordan Love threw more interceptions when targeting Christian Watson than he did to Reed, Wicks, and Dobbs combined. That ain't good. And if you're thinking in terms of sample size, Watson actually had the least amount of targets of the four. And he still wound up with more picks going his way than the other three combined. That ain't good. But his ability to take the top off a of defense, and again, it goes a lot farther than just being fast. If they just want someone who's just fast, okay, go have Bo Melton just run a nine route. It'll still do it. Like, it'll still take some attraction. It'll still take some top of it. But not like Christian Watson. We've seen it. The evidence is there. And again, no real numbers to back that up. Just an eye test thing. Without Christian Watson, they can be a great offense, probably top five. I mean, look at how they were in the second half of the year without Christian Watson. Pretty good. But if they really want to ascend to the heights that they can, out of all the pass catchers, most important one to reaching that potential probably is Christian Watson. Join me on Wednesday for Late Night LTB Live. 8 o'clock Central is when we're going to be doing that. Different folks, same folks, come hang out. Let's chalk Packers on a Wednesday night in June. What else are we doing? Not a lot. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me here. Do hope you have a wonderful week. I'll see you on Wednesday. And as always, go Packers. Oh, 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 oh,